Hello, um, I'm Rebecca Batt from Pump Court Chambers and um, thank you for joining us on this new practitioner series and welcome to this webinar which will deal with default judgments and setting aside default judgments. So um, turning firstly to deal with what a default judgment is um, and how it is obtained. Um, default judgments are governed by part 12 of the civil procedure rules and a Default judgment is a judgment of the court on a claim, but it arises out of an administrative act or process rather than from the court making any sort of evaluative decision on the claim. So it's different then from a summary judgment, which relies upon the court deciding that there is no real prospect of success of the claim. To obtain a default judgment against a defendant, um, the defendant must have failed to acknowledge a acknowledge service of the claim or fail to file a defence within the specified time limits. There are um, a couple of situations where default judgment cannot be obtained, for example, on a claim for delivery of goods, which is subject to an agreement regulated by the Consumer Credit Act 1974, or where the Part 8 procedure has been used or any other case where a rule or practice direction states that the claimant may not obtain default judgment. Um, those exceptions are contained within CPR 12.2. In terms then of the relevant time limits, these are set out at 10.3 of the CPR in terms of acknowledging service. Um, as a basic rule, um, the time limit is 14 days after service of the particulars of claim where the claimant serves a claim form and states that the particulars of claim are to follow and 14 days after the service of the claim form in any other case. There are some additional provisions if the claim form is served outside of the jurisdiction or in particular cases where the court is required to specify the period of time for acknowledging service, so just be mindful of those um, particular circumstances. In terms of the time limit for filing a defence, um, this is in CPR 15.4, and it's either 14 days after the service of the particulars of claim, or if the defendant files an acknowledgement of service, then the defendant has 28 days after the service of the particulars of claim. In order to obtain um, a default judgment under CPR 12.3, um, you have to satisfy the conditions which are set out there. So they are that the defendant has failed to acknowledge service or to file a defence in accordance with those time limits. And you can only obtain judgment in default of a defence if an acknowledgement of service has been filed, but a defence has not been filed. So your first port of call is whether or not an acknowledgement of service has been filed. If not, you move to whether a defence has been filed. But if an acknowledgement hasn't been filed, you can get a default judgment on that basis. There are some um, specific cases in which you cannot obtain a default judgment. So if the defendant has applied to have the claimant's statement of case struck out, for example, if the defendant is arguing that the claimant has disclosed no reasonable grounds for bringing the claim, or if the defendant has applied for summary judgment and either of those applications haven't been dealt with at the time um, that an application for default judgment has been made. You also cannot obtain default judgment if the defendant has satisfied the whole claim, um, including any claim for costs, or in claims for money where the defendant has filed and served an admission and requested time to pay. So those are circumstances in which you cannot get default judgment. Um, the procedure for applying for default judgment varies depending on what the claim is for. So if the claim is for a specified amount of money or an amount to be decided by the court, or for delivery of goods where an alternative um, has been given that the defendant can pay their value, then the claimant can file a request for default judgment. And that will be on the relevant form, which is set out in the procedure rules. And where the claim is for an amount to be decided by the court or for the value of goods to be decided, if the court then enters default judgment, 
it will give appropriate directions and allocate the case um, for the purposes of that amount to be decided. An important addition to the rules, um, which was made when they were updated in 2022, is that if the defendant is an individual, you must provide their date of birth within the form when requesting um, your default judgment. So that's a request for default judgment. If the claim is for any other remedy than those that I've set out, um, then an application must be made in accordance with part 23 of the civil procedure rule. So this is an application rather than a request, unless the claimant in their request for judgment abandons the remedy, which is other than the ones that I've just set out. In addition, if the claim is against a child or a protected party, or it is a claim in tort by one spouse or civil partner against another, then you also need to use part 23. So the last point on this slide is um, if the claim is for money or delivery of goods um, and the claim is against more than one defendant, that is not a bar to obtaining default judgment against one of the defendants and continuing with the claim against the other defendants. If the claim against that defendant can be dealt with separately from the claim against the other defendants, then default judgment can be entered against them and the proceedings continuing against the other defendants. Conversely, if the claim cannot be dealt with separately, then the court will not enter default judgment against that one defendant, but will deal with the application for default judgment at the same time as it deals with the claim against the other defendants. So that's obtaining default judgment. But once it has been obtained, if you're acting for the defendant, what can you do about it? CPR 13 deals with setting aside default judgments. And there are two ways, essentially, to set aside a default judgment. Either the defendant can show that the judgment was wrongly entered. And if you can show this, then the court must set it aside. That's the mandatory ground for setting aside default judgment, which falls under CPR 13.2. Or you can make an application to have the default judgment set aside on the basis that the defendant has a real prospect of successfully defending the claim or that there is some other good reason why the judgment should be set aside. This is dealt with under CPR 13.3 and this is a discretionary ground. So the court may set aside the default judgment if those conditions are true, but they don't have to in the way that they do under 13.2. Considering those in turn then, and turning to the mandatory ground first, this applies essentially where there's been a misunderstanding or procedural error and the default judgment has been entered despite the conditions for obtaining that judgment not being fulfilled. So the obvious way in which that happens is where the claimant applies for default judgment on the basis that the defendant has failed to file a defence or an acknowledgement of service within the time limits, but in actual fact, the defence or acknowledgement has been filed in accordance with the rules. So an important point for claimants here, if you are applying for default judgment, is to check and double check that the time limit for filing the defence or acknowledging service has actually passed. Because if it hasn't and you apply for default judgment and are successful, um, it would be set aside on any application um, by the defendant. Um, default judgment will also be set aside if the defendant has applied for summary judgment or to have the claimant's case struck out, or if they have satisfied the claim before the judgment was entered, or they've made an admission and requested time to pay. So it's the, the reverse of the conditions which you need to obtain default judgment. If any of those are true, then it will be set aside. Um, it's important to note that because this is a mandatory ground and because this relates to procedure um, and what has or hasn't happened, um, the default judgment will be set aside even if, for example, there is no defence to the claim when you consider the merits of the defence. Um, if the judgment has been wrongly entered, then the court has to set it aside. So that's the mandatory ground. <clears throat> 
But what do you do if default judgment has been entered against you and it's been done validly and you cannot rely on 13.2 to um, set the default judgment aside? Well, then you turn to the discretionary ground. Um, you can still make an application for default judgment to be set aside on the basis that either you have a real prospect of successfully defending the claim or there is some other good reason why judgment should be set aside or varied and the defendant allowed to defend the claim. The really important point under this section of the CPR is that the CPR specifically tells the court that it has to consider whether the application was made promptly. So time is of the essence if you're making this application. If you find default judgment entered against you and you it's validly entered, you really need to get your application to set it aside in quickly. Looking at the, the first option then, a real prospect of successfully defending the claim. This is the same test as the one used for summary judgment under CPR 24. So it will be familiar um, to everyone from, from that. But the only difference here is where the burden of proof lies. So obviously, if you're making an application for summary judgment, you would be running the argument that the other side does not have a real prospect of success. Whereas here, the argument is that you do have a real prospect of success. So for that reason, all of the same guidance on the test applies to these circumstances in the same way as it does to summary judgment applications. So for example, it's not sufficient to have just an arguable defense. It has to be more than merely arguable. And the prospect of success must be real, so not false, fanciful or imaginary. Plainly under this ground, if you're making an application um, under this provision, the court will need to be able to evaluate your defence. So exhibiting a draft defence to your application notice will be helpful um, and will enable the court to see the facts which will be relied upon by the defendant and allow the court to assess um, your prospect of success. Um, turning to the second option under CPR 13.3, which is some other good reason, and this is some other good reason why the judgment should be set aside or varied, or a good reason why the defendant should be allowed to defend the claim. And um, this is a freestanding alternative to the real prospect of successful defence limb. So although some of the same arguments may apply, um, defendants are able to run either or both of these grounds as reasons for the default judgment to be set aside. So an example of a case um, where a default judgment was set aside on the basis of some other good reason is where the claim contained obviously the wrong figure. So judgment was entered for a figure in a claim form, which was obviously the wrong figure. As I mentioned earlier, um, the court has to consider whether the application was made promptly. Of course, courts are generally concerned about ensuring the finality of litigation so it follows that a claimant with a validly entered default judgment should not be open to the risk of that being set aside for years after the event. And of course, it also echoes the overriding objective that cases should be dealt with expeditiously. Having said that, and whilst the need to act promptly is specifically mentioned in the CPR, the promptness of the application will be weighed against the other factors um, which are mentioned in the CPR and all the circumstances of the case. So there are a number of cases in which default judgment has been set aside despite the application not being made promptly. For example, if the court considers that there's no prejudice to the claimant as a result of the delay, and the court considered that it was just and appropriate for the substantive matters of the claim to be considered, then the promptness um, of the application becomes less relevant. In addition, there have been cases where the court considered that the defendant was not solely responsible for the delay and that the defence was particularly strong um, and the promptness has again become less relevant. Moving to the last thing that needs to be um, considered when making an application to set aside default judgment, 
there has been um, a divergence, a disagreement between the case law over the years about whether or not CPR 3.9, which is the test for relief from sanctions, and therefore the Denton principles, um, apply to applications for default judgment to be set aside. The case of um, PXC and AB College in 2022 highlighted this divergence in the case law and went as far as expressing the view that the principles in CPR 3.9 and the Denton principles were not applicable to applications to set aside default judgment. That was a, a high court decision, and the judge in that case accepted that the debate would have to continue until there was a binding decision from the Court of Appeal. We now have a binding decision from the Court of Appeal, which disagrees with that judgment. So earlier this year, um, in the case of FXF and English Karate Federation, the Court of Appeal held that CPR 3.9 and therefore the Denton Principles must be considered on any application to set aside default judgment under that discretionary ground of CPR 13.3. So the issue um, for now is resolved and those principles do apply. The Court of Appeal in that case of FXF considered that in the cases where Denton had been held not to apply, um, the court had taken what they referred to as an unduly academic approach. So for now, where an application to set aside default judgment is made, um, the court will need to consider that 3.9 and the three-stage Denton test. The reality is, um, and this was what the Court of Appeal found to have happened in the case of FXF, that the majority of applications to set aside default judgment will have considered the points raised by CPR 3.9 and the three-stage Denton test anyway. It's just that they may not have explicitly referred to those um, factors as being from CPR 3.9 or the Denton test. Therefore, in addition to establishing a reasonable prospect of success or some other good reason, the court will need to consider under CPR 3.9 all of the circumstances of the case but specifically including the need for litigation to be conducted efficiently and at proportionate cost. That is really an echo of the requirement for an application to be made promptly um, and the overriding objective, as well as um, the need to enforce compliance with rules, practice directions and court orders. The three-stage Denton test, of course, requires the court to consider whether the breach was serious or significant. So in these circumstances, the breach will always be the failure to file a defence or acknowledge service within the time limits. If that breach is found to be serious or significant, the court will consider why it is that that breach has occurred. So in the evidence that supports any application notice, um, detail will be required as to why it is um, that that defence wasn't filed on time or service wasn't acknowledged on time. And again, the court has to consider all of the circumstances of the case and the parts of the CPR 3.9. In addition to Denton, which is just one case which considers um, CPR 3.9, any other case law which is relevant to that section can be considered by the court in determining an application to set aside default judgment. So that is a whistle-stop tour through um, default judgment and setting aside default judgment and the things the court will consider when looking to set it aside. Um, that brings me to the end of this webinar. Thank you very much for listening.